it's wonderful to have you here in La Roche, France. Thank Missy. you. Thank and, you so much. And to, to see you play with Delamay last night was also extraordinary. How was, was that for you? Oh my gosh, it was so much fun. I, I, I love those gals and it's just such a good, great treat to get to come here and be with them uh, in La Roche. And uh, you've traveled so much in Europe. We from the European Bluegrass Music Association are interested in knowing how you, as a professional musician with so many gifts and so much experience, how you view bluegrass in Europe. What have you noticed about it? Is it different? Is it? <laughs> you know, I, I, what I've felt every single time, every trip here, is um, nothing but just a complete warm embrace from from. Uh, the European bluegrass crowd um, across the board in, in all the countries and um, I think the folks uh, who are uh, who love bluegrass um, you know when they see folks from America come to play um, they just seem very happy to, to have us here and they make us feel very welcome and so I felt nothing but extreme welcome and inclusion and so it, it, that's a great feeling. It's, it's worth coming across the pond for. <laughs> well, we hope you can do that many more times in the future. Not to mention the food <laughs> and the wine and, and, and just the, the warmness of the people. Well, I think most of us in Europe know you as a bassist and a singer, and we've definitely heard that you've won over seven different, if I'm correct, IBMA Performer of the Year awards for bass playing. And now this year, not one, but you have two nominations, um, first for Instrumental Player of the Year, and then also for Collaborative Recording of the Year, uh, I believe for your um, video and song, Darling Pals of Mine. Yes. And so I was wondering um, if you could talk first about how it feels to have two nominations uh, based on all of the incredible work you've just done. Oh, it, it, you know, that it's always an honor, uh, those nominations from, from IBMA and um, from my peers. It's, it's, it's a truly a great honor and, and I, never, um, I never take it for granted. And I, I, I'm very grateful every year that something, when something happens, um, it just feels, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it just makes you sort of feel like, okay, Everything, all the miles, all the days uh, that we spend doing what we what we love to do, and I feel very blessed to get to do what I love to do. Um, but it's 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 a path not chosen frequently, and so there's there's definitely trials and things that go with it. So these kinds of events just kind of make me feel like I'm I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I know that in my heart anyway, but these just make it all, all, all that much better and so I appreciate it very much it, it's just very meaningful to me to have any you know the recognition and the the darling pals of mine is uh, particularly so my record last year um, this this the same record Royal Traveler um, this we could talk about that in a second but this the song swept away actually won a recorded event of the year, which is now the collaborative event of the year. So this is the second year I've had a song up for running um, in that category. And this song, this is actually a, a tune, it's an instrumental that I did with Todd Phillips and Mike Bubb, who are two of my bass heroes, um, people that I looked up to as I was playing and um, have become friends with and along with Alison Brown who produced the whole record. And your lyrics, I know I listened to that song for the first time and it stuck. I heard a tune you used to play and I was swept away. And that is so you, don't you think? Well, I, I appreciate that. That song was actually written by Lori Lewis. Okay. And she is another, another one of my heroes. Uh, again, that song um, Allison and I, well, Lori had actually pitched me that song a, a few years ago. To, she said, you should do this song. And, um, and I said, yes, I, would, I should do that song. But it wasn't time then. This was many years ago. And when I was getting ready to do this record, um, uh, 
we, we were looking for songs, and so I, I brought that one back up, and I thought, this is the time. So Allison came up with the idea to record it with Molly Tuttle, Sierra Hall, Becky Buller, herself, and me, and we were the first five women to win in our instrumental categories uh, at IBMA. So it ended up being the first ladies of bluegrass, and then that song sort of um, took on a life of its own, and as I said, won recorded at the end of the year in 2018. So it's, yeah, it's a meaningful song and it, it means a lot to me that Lori wrote that as well, another really strong woman who I've always looked up to and who's had a lot to do with me pursuing a solo career. And some of the things you've mentioned on your CD notes include that this talks about your roots, um, it talks about your choices, it talks about love, um, it talks about the fragileness of family and faith. Those are all really deep things that move people. I, I found myself in the last few years um, writing more than I ever have in my life. I, I didn't write the, for, for years and years, um, but then I found myself uh, really wanting and needing the outlet that is songwriting. And so I started writing and I found myself I didn't think about the, the subjects that I was going to write. I didn't sort of like craft them beforehand. I just found myself writing about things that mattered to me. And, and um, I've lost uh, uh, several family members in, over the last uh, several years. And, um, and so it's been, it's, it, it, it's been very hard, but it was able to, uh, try to try to sort of go back and, and, and and, pro and sort of process some of those feelings a little bit by trying to write and, and express some of that. And it, it, it's, it's good therapy. <laughs> but do you also agree with those um, who say that, you know, this, this CD, Royal Traveler, was another first for you because you, people at least, realized all of your songwriting ability and your interpretation as well as an artist. It just came forward. Uh, you weren't the bass player, you were everything on this CD. Would you agree with that? Well, you know, I, I definitely feel like I I definitely took some chances and, and I have sort of putting myself in that, in a position um, that I'm, I haven't been as much before. Um, and a, a lot of that is with the help of Alison Brown. Um, and that was why I, ch I chose her, and, and, and you know she agreed, thankfully, to produce the album. I wanted, uh, I wanted to be pushed a little bit and sort of see what I could do. And so yeah, it, it's definitely um, the first time I've put so much of myself out in front, and and the part of parts of myself that uh, are, are, this is probably the most personal album I've ever done. Yeah. Could you tell us, um, to all the listeners, um, what this statement from you means? I am a royal traveler, my life, a long great song. So the, the title song to this album is a song that um, started f from, I bought a tiny little vintage suitcase uh, and I saw it at a thrift store and I went in and saw it from across the room. It's one of those little 70s turquoise blue little train case. And I bought it and I opened it up and it smelled like my mother. And, and it just kind of was like, ah, my, my mom's been gone for a long time. And so it, the suitcase sort of uh, was a symbol to me of just being able to, to travel and to sort of travel through obstacles and all that sort of thing. Um, I started carrying it around with me and then the story is the song became, so that was just in and of itself, but I was traveling with this suitcase and I was traveling into, by myself, uh, I had a long day of driving in the snow and I picked up the suitcase as I was about to get it, put it into the van and I looked on the, the, the handle for the first time, I actually read the words, and the words were "Royal Traveler." Oh my gosh! <laughs> and I looked at it, and I thought, 
that's me. I am a royal trap. Like, because I was feeling, t I was at the moment, at that moment, I was feeling very tired, sort of travel worn, you know, a little weary of the road, and feeling like, you know, what does it all mean? And just kind of do you know, sort of taking these kinds of, you know, moments where we sort of self evaluate and question ourselves. And at that moment, I was given, I felt like a sign, I saw this, these words, royal traveler. And, and it, it made me think, I am a royal traveler. And, and then I started thinking of it bigger. So that song started then, and I finished it with my friend Ed Snodderly, who's one of my um, mentors and, and heroes of a songwriter. But I started thinking of it in the bigger picture of the fact that we're all actually travelers. We're all very royal travelers because everyone, you get up in the morning and, and you're traveling through a day. You're traveling through stuff. You're traveling through work, through family, through through challenges, and whether you leave your home or not. And there's something really very royal about that and about just showing up. And so I feel like, you know, my life it, to this point is, it's still grand because I keep showing up. And the other thing about that, I think many people have noticed too, that you're such a good collaborator. And this award you are now nominated for, this collaborative recording, so I wonder if you could talk to us about how you and Allison put that together. It's so oh. exciting. Oh, the, 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 the credit so goes to Allison for this. She has more ideas than anyone I've ever known. <laughs> and so she, she had the idea that we should do this song, Darling Pals of Mine. She always wants, she's, you know, I'm a banjo player, you're a bass player, this is what, this is the tune that, that, that you know, uh, was so popular for, for um, these guys, you know, for Earl Scruggs. And, um, but then, she's, then she had the idea to bring in a couple of other bass players, and, and I said, well, I know who we need to get, and, and Mike Love and, and Todd were the perfect choices for it, and they were such great sports about it, because, I mean, it was, it was not an easy thing to come up with, um, and uh, in terms of trying to play a lot of it recorded on just one instrument, and so it's actually recorded the whole first two thirds of it are recorded on just one bass and one banjo, and then and then we did play three basses at the end, but but it, it's really fun. And when all of you had your hands on that bass, yeah. we were all wondering <laughs> where the sound was. I know where it was, it was so incredible. <laughs> <laughs> then, then there was working that part up for the visual. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. So they were. So I, I could not do. You know, and that's the, that's the, the beauty of this world, of this music world, is that you know I'm surrounded by um, friends and uh, colleagues and people who are willing to give their time and their talent to help one another. Well, for, um, I think it would be nice to, to talk now a bit about your roots. I, I know I've visited your state once, but um, could you like to talk about West Virginia and your start as a musician? Where did this all begin with acoustic bass? And, and State. How did you get involved in that? Well, you know, my, my parents uh, are the reason that I that I was knew what bluegrass was because they were already into it before I was born, and they were always already going to see shows and hear music live um, for entertainment. And so when I was very young, they just dragged me along with my siblings, and <laughs> and and I ended up falling in love with it. And so once I once I, they realized that I had this passion for it, then they made as many opportunities for me as possible, and they did whatever they could to allow me to be in a setting where I could um, be exposed to it. And, and as far as playing the bass, I, I was playing piano and guitar, and then my dad brought a bass home. It, well, not really for me. I wasn't thinking about it, but it, for himself, I think, for fun. And so, he, and he did play a little bit, but the bass was in the house when you're a kid, you have curiosity, and it was just, I just started playing it and I fell in love. I think for many female musicians worldwide, you've, you've just become a very important role model, and you, you do a lot of work with different very famous women as well. Um, 
can you talk a bit about the First Ladies of Bluegrass that you mentioned earlier in the interview and, and uh, your work with any of them, including Allison, of course? How did you, how did you blend into that? Oh, you know, the, the, the time to get to play with, with the First Ladies, um, with Molly and Sierra, Becky and Allison, is absolute precious time for me and, and I very much enjoy it, um, getting to spend time with other women who um, are facing the same things that I'm facing, same challenges, same, same goals uh, as a woman. Um, you know, m most of my career have, I've been predominantly, I've worked mostly with men and that's been fabulous and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that it's been, it's been nice to, to have more women these days who are um, pursuing this, the same things that I am and to be able to share and, and to, to um, you know, share in a way that, that only two women can share with, uh, about uh, certain things. And so that's something that I, that hasn't always been around. There's always been women, but few and far between. You know, uh, Allison and I, who are, are the, we're the same age, and and we often sit and and talk about the fact that it's you know we've known each other for a long time, um, but it's nice to have more women coming into the room and for the conversation. And you've sort of been the glue in a lot of bands, if I can put it that way. Every time we've seen these women, you've been there with your bass. Uh, and I don't know. The bass, is, it, it's just because of the, the bass is sort of that instrument that it gets to float around, so I'm, I'm lucky that way. A couple of days ago you were talking about something special that happened at the Newport Festival. It was a really interesting story. Would you like to tell everyone oh about my gosh. that? It, it was just... <coughs> we. We recently, the First Ladies were asked to be a part of Brandy Carlisle's uh, women's collaboration set at the Newport Folk Festival in 2019. And so, and we were told that there were spe very, 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 very special guests. Um, and, uh, and we were told who they might be and, and, and we were just ex very excited about that. And it turns out they were they were actually there. And so the, the special guest was a, a, a surprise appearance with Dolly Parton. And, um, and Cheryl Crow was there, and there was just tons of these amazing strong women. And, uh, but Dolly's was the, the, you know, sort of the, the, the finale, and she came out. And then she invited all the women who were part of the collaboration to come out on stage and, and sing nine to five with her. <laughs> So, yeah, in my wildest dreams, I'm one, you know, standing up there with, with all of us and, and um, you know, we're just watching her and singing with her, but, but mostly just, you know, being supportive. And then, and then at one point there's some great photos where everyone just starts bowing down to Dolly uh, because we all know that she is, she's one of, she's one of those, she's a unicorn. <laughs> she's one of those... Uh, you know, very rare um, people who've come along. She's she's managed to um, uh, maintain uh, this integrity and her artist artistic uh, endeavor. And she's just the whole package. And isn't she a bit like you that she was supporting women all along through her career where she could? Oh yeah, but she and she but she is, yeah she she's. She's amazing, and and just a huge role model, I think, for so many. And then she's she's done things like you know she's she her she has a a, lit, a, a, a reading program where she supplies books for children up for the first six years of their lives. You know she's given away I can't even think millions of books to children. All you have to do is sign up, and they're free, and you get a book every month for the first six years of your life. So she's, she's not just doing, you know, like her music work, she's actually giving back to the world. And she's tons of examples of that, where she's used her power and her money and, and her um, stature for the good, uh, you know, of, of, of mankind. So it's, it's, it's pretty, she's pretty amazing.
So she was been a role model for a lot of female musicians. Well. I think so, and I think for men too. And she's just like she's just really good. So it was really super fun, and we got to our the first ladies were paired also with um, uh, Yola, who's this great uh, uh, British um, singer that we got to sing with, and with also with Brandy Carlisle and Bonnie Payne. So it was just an amazing day, and. Um, so, yeah. um, I'd like to just ask you a couple more questions. And one, it's been stated that you never let grass of any kind grow under your feet. <laughs> it kind of fits with being a royal traveler, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but that you also push um, musical boundaries. Is that something you feel represents you? Well, I, I suppose I, I have, I, came into bluegrass, um, you know, I sort of grew up in the, in the 70s and, and was affected uh, deeply by uh, folks like Sam Bush, um, Tony Rice, David Grisman, um, uh, also uh, very much the, uh, the other guys too, like the, the, the first generation, well, Bill Monroe, Ralph Stanley, all of those guys for sure. But, but I then sort of got influenced again by the second generation of the ones I just mentioned. All of those guys, Monroe, Stanley, uh, you know, Jim and Jesse, Mac Wiseman, in addition with Sam Bush, Tony Rice, David Grisman, they all have one thing in common to me, and that is uh, innovation. They're all innovators. Every one of the traditional first generation uh, uh, folks were innovators. They were all doing their own thing, as were the, you know, the second generation and 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 so on. And so, to me, bluegrass has always been about innovation and about sort of doing your own thing, but under the umbrella, under a very big umbrella called bluegrass. And so, to to remain individual, I think, is a really powerful thing. So yes, I have always. Um, my music hasn't always been strictly uh, a traditional or strictly new grass. It's, it's been a, the combination of things that I have been influenced by. And that is largely bluegrass, but also some other things, jazz, pop, other sounds. Just as Bill Monroe was influenced by what was around him at the time mm -hmm. when he started to play. Um, he was influenced with black blues and with folk music and old time fiddle music and then he, he did his own thing and I think that I know that, that all of those first guys were trying to be individual, trying to be artistic and they were and uh, so that, so yeah, I just feel like, I don't feel like I'm doing anything like stepping out and doing something unique, I feel like I'm just trying to honor the tradition of bluegrass, which I believe is actually innovation, that it needs to keep uh, representing the people that are doing it at the time. So we'll take that advice into EBMA and we'll do our very best to keep it growing. Oh, absolutely. I think you guys are doing a fantastic job of it and thank you for welcoming us into the fold. Thank you for this interview with you. Thank you.